So this is the last lesson of the summer quarter, 2024, lesson 13. The title of the lesson is The Life of Love, and it's Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 2 through chapter 8, verse 14. The Lord, this is your endorsement of marriage and love in marriage, and uh, uh, we thank you for it. We thank you. Uh, we pray that our own marriages would be like this. We pray that you would give us uh, wisdom as we look through it. In Jesus' name, amen. So it starts in uh, chapter 5, verse 2, and then goes through chapter 6, verse 3, and that part is not covered. So this is what it, this is an overview of what it is going over. Uh, the the young lady, they're now married. She says she's asleep, but her heart is awake. So she is in a dream now. The groom came to the door after hours. She was already in bed. She didn't want to get up because she'd already prepared for bed. She'd washed her feet. She got in bed, and so the husband is knocking on the door, and she didn't, didn't want to get up. So she refused him. It was inconvenient. Then she changed her mind, and by the time she changed her mind, he was gone. She went looking for him, and during this, remember, she had a dream before. the watch. She talked to watchmen in that dream, and they were helpful to her. Here the watchman beat her and took her shawl. Then the daughters of Jerusalem wanted a description of her husband, so she gave a glowing description of him, and then she found him at home. Then she proclaims the mutual ownership of one for the other. That's uh, chapter 6 and verse 3. It said, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. And she said that before. We talked about that before. So in section A, it's the lover play, praises his beloved. So in the text, the uh, groom, the husband, is called beloved, and the hi, and the uh, woman is called darling. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, yeah. Human marriage in Ephesians five is uh, compared with Christ in the church. It should be a picture of Christ in the church. So, yeah. So anyway, you know the uh, quarterly uses the NIV translation, so that's why they have different, uh, you know, categories for the husband and the wife. But this one says, the lover praises his beloved, part one. And it's chapter 6, verse 4 through 13a. And I'll read that part. Okay, this is the husband talking. You are as beautiful as Tirza, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem, as awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have confused me. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes, which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost her young. Your temples are like a slice of a pomegranate behind your veil. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and maidens without number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique. She is her mother's only daughter. She is the pure child of the one who bore her. The maidens saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines also, and they praised her, saying, Who is this that grows like the dawn? As beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, as awesome as an army with banners. I went down to the orchard of nut trees to see the blossoms of the valley to see whether the vine had budded or the pomegranates had bloomed. Before I was aware, my soul set me over the chariots of my noble people. Come back, come back, O Shulamite. Come back, come back, that we may gaze at you. 
Okay, so in verse 4, she's, uh, he says she's as beautiful as Tirza. Everybody know what Tirza is? Tirza is a city in northern Israel. It was very briefly the capital of the northern kingdom. I think under Baasha, like the second king of the northern kingdom, and, and maybe one or two more. Before, it was Om, Omri, who's Ahab's father, that moved the northern capital to Samaria. So apparently it was a pretty city. <laughs> he says, you're as beautiful as Tirza and as Jerusalem. So we know what Jerusalem was. Um, that is the capital of the southern kingdom. Then verse 5 says, Turn your eyes away from me, for they have confused me. So apparently it's hard for him to look at her eyes because they're beautiful. That messes up his mind. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and then he says, and he said this before, your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Gilead. Quarterly said that the goats in uh, Kedar, which is where she is from, were black. And, uh, and so this is a, a picture of pretty black hair, you know, flowing down over her shoulders. Then in uh, verses 8 and 9, you know, and then he talks about her teeth. Her teeth are like ewes. They're clean and white. They're even. Okay, so she's not British, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, and I know, that's cold. And uh, I apologize. <laughs> and then uh, your temples are like a slice of a pomegranate behind your veils, um, th that's exactly the phraseology he used back in chapter 4. Then in verse 8 it says, There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and maidens without number. So here you, our knowledge of Solomon's history comes into play, and, uh, and it makes us uh, wonder. You know, I said earlier that I thought, well, maybe this is his first wife before Pharaoh's daughter. I don't know if I mean seeing this, you know. You know, with so many uh, wives and women around, it's hard to imagine love blooming like this, <laughs> you know, especially on the wife's side, to, you know, because at the end of the lesson, we'll, we'll. A phrase comes in that I think is very powerful. It says, love is as strong as death. And then it talks about jealousy. And um, so, I mean, the way we know that Solomon's family was, you know, I, I trust that this book was inspired by the Holy Spirit and is telling us true things. Uh, so, but he's comparing these 60 queens and 80 concubines. Remember, he had 700 wives and 300 concub concubines. So maybe this was early in his <laughs> reign. He'd only gathered 60 queens and 80 concubines, but they're maidens without number. But then he puts this Shulamite woman who he's just married above them all. He says she is perfect, she is unique, she is her mother's only daughter. So that made me think, you know, the compliments are flowing right and left here. So what is the difference between compliments and flattery? Okay, yeah. Yeah, flattery is usually uh, not heartfelt, right? It's false compliments meant to connive, you know, like a con artist, to get something. You want to get something. You want them to be, it's buttering them up. You want them to do something for you or to put you in a position for something, some benefit to yourself. Uh, compliments are just gifts to the other person. Okay, so that's... Uh, that's all I got out of that. Does anybody else have anything? 
In the Old Testament, poly- polygamy was rampant. Yes. Yeah, yeah, polygamy was rampant in the Old Testament. You know, it it began with Lamech, pre-flood. Um, I can't remember which one down who was from Adam. He was in Cain's line. He he was the first one that had two wives. And the Lord tolerated polygamy under the law. He didn't endorse it. He tol- he tolerated it, just like he tolerated divorce. <laughs> he tolerated divorce under the law. Yeah, because of the hardness of your hearts. That's what Jesus yeah. said. But when people ask Jesus about divorce or uh, marriage, he went back to creation. One man, one woman for a lifetime. And... Um, and and so that is the standard now is that you know the standard is frequently uh, missed um in modern days and it was obviously frequently missed in uh old testament times too you know david had how many wives that almost 20 he had almost 20 wives it seems like he had one child from each one <laughs> and so he did the same thing you know just not to the extent that Solomon did. So the the families are not going to be as close because there's going to be, you know, rivalries, jealousy, uh, things like that. And it's just, it's sin. <laughs> so it's, like, it's allowing sin into the uh, marital relationship, basically. No, I don't think that, that's the reason. I think it's just the sinful desires. Um, yeah, you know Solomon married Pharaoh's daughter for a political alliance, and he married a lot of women for p- political reasons. Um, this woman he loved. Okay, section B is the lover praises his beloved. Part two. So that's six thirteen B through seven nine A. Okay, so 613b starts out, Why should you gaze at the Shulamite as at the dance of the two companies? How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. Okay, now he's going to compliment her, starting at her feet and going to her head. Every part of her body. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. The curves of your hips are like jewels, the work of the hands of an artist. Your navel is like a round goblet which never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is like a heap of wheat, fenced about with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like a tower of ivory. Your eyes like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which faces toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Carmel, and the flowing locks of your head are like purple threads. The king is captivated by your tresses. How beautiful and how delightful you are, my love, with all your charms. Your stature is like a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I said I will climb the palm tree, I will take hold of its fruit stalks, Oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the fragrance of your breath like apples. Uh, A little more. And your mouth like the best wine. It goes down smoothly for my beloved, flowing gently through the lips of those who fall asleep. Okay. What do you think of that? This is God's word. This is God's word. Yeah, it does make you a little uncomfortable, doesn't it? Reading it out loud, (laughs) it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so this, there's a little exercise in the uh, quarterly, and um, I want to go through this exercise. So basically it says, ask your group members to take a minute to read through that passage. When they're finished, ask this, why would God place an intimate description like this one in the Bible? 
What does this reflect about God's view of marriage? Why did God put this in the Bible? What do you think? Anything else about that? About why God put this in the Bible? And what does this reflect about God's view of marriage? Right? Physical union as well as emotional. Yeah, both physical and emotional and spiritual. Yeah, it is a union of uh, body, soul, and mind. Yeah, so this is what the quarterly, the answer they gave, which I thought was good. God wants us to have a balanced biblical view of marital intimacy. The Song of Songs teaches us to accept romantic love as God's gift to us and to exercise it within God. God ordained context of marriage. You know, when before you're married, there should be none of that, right? After you're married, what should happen? Yeah, there should be a lot of that. Yeah, at, after you're married, it's the exact opposite. What does 1 Corinthians 7 uh, four and five say it says the wife does not have authority over her own body but the husband does and likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife does stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control so after marriage the onus is on the other side before you're married, the onus is always no, 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 no. After you're married, married, it's always yes. If anyone shows any interest, the other should say yes. You never say no. You know, say yes. Because you're married. <laughs> and you should. And that's where it is, that is where it is meant to happen, take place. So what distorted views of romance have you encountered? What kind of di distorted views of romance have you do we encounter? We encountered it all the time in our culture. What kind of dis we talked about it last week, right? This idea that you should just try it out before marriage. Okay. So um and that the culture is um that sex before and outside of marriage is perfectly acceptable behavior. That's what the culture thinks. Okay, so that is a distorted view of marriage. At the other extreme, some people wrongly believe sex is inherently evil, even within marriage. I think there was a, a religious group back in the 1800s, might have been the 1700s, called the Shakers, that wouldn't have sex in marriage <laughs> because they thought it was evil. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, so that tends to decrease the population. So, um, so anyway, you know, God created us male and female. He concluded his creation was very good. Even though we must condemn some practices as distorted, we need to clearly say that God's gift of romantic love is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, the many of the gifts that the Lord gives us can be misused for evil. And that's one that is frequently misused for evil. Yeah, isn't that what the proverb says about the prostitute? The prostitute will reduce a man to a loaf of bread. Yeah. Okay, so then section C, the beloved answers her lover. So this is... Uh, 79B to 84. I already read 79. So uh, 710, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go out into the country. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us rise early. I'll start over. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go out into the country. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us rise early and go to the vineyards. 
Let us see whether the vine has budded and its blossoms have opened and whether the pomegranates have bloomed. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes have given forth fragrance, and over our doors are all choice fruits, both new and old, which I have saved up for you, my beloved. Chapter 8 O oh, that you were like a brother to me, who nursed at my, brother, my mother's breasts. If I found you outdoors, I would kiss you. No one would despise me either. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, who used to instruct me. I would give you spiced wine to drink from the juice of my pomegranates. Let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. I want you to swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Or do not arouse or awaken love until she pleases. Uh, that's in the original. Okay. So what's going on here? They're going on a vacation, right? They're married now. And, uh, you know, they had their wedding night last week. And then they're, you know, they're newlyweds, so they're still interested in each other. <laughs> and, but then she says, uh, she repeats this, I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. And so she understands this. And it's interesting that that word for desire uh, is the same word for desire that uh, is in Genesis 3.16. To the woman, it says, your desire will be for your husband, and he will reign over you. And uh, yeah, here I think clearly the context is about, you know, physical desire. Um, there, I think it's both, probably, because we use Genesis 3.16 in Genesis 4. That same word is used by God to Cain about sin. Sin's desire is for you, but you must control it. That was just before he killed his brother. And, and so they use that to say that that word is the desire of a woman to can be in control in the marriage, which is against God's leadership plan. God designed marriage for the husband to be uh, the head of the wife, and, um, you know, it, so that, that's the way it should be, not because the husband is any better than the wife, but because the Lord has assigned roles that way. And usually, uh, because of sin, the, the wife wants to control in a marriage. That's just natural. That's how it is. And so that is why if Ephesians chapter 5 makes marriage pleasant. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 makes marriage the way it should be. And yeah, that's what she was doing. And it's been that way ever since, you know, and Adam was uh, passive in that setting. You know, who knows what would happen if Adam said no? What would have happened if Adam said no? I don't know, <laughs> you know, we don't know what would have happened, uh, but he didn't, he was very passive, he just did what she asked, and she had been deceived, truly deceived by the serpent, and, um, you know, we like to think that we would do better, I don't think we would, <laughs> I don't think we would do any better, and the Lord knew all of this, and uh, so that that was the whole idea for a savior, you know. Um, but with the Holy Spirit, you can do the right thing. Yeah, so in verse 11, she's inviting him to a vacation outside of Jerusalem, amongst nature. So what are some things couples can do now to enrich their marriage? Should couples be doing things to enrich their marriages? Yes. What what are some things you can do? 
Well, yeah, I mean, you can do like what these two did. They went on a little vacation. They went on a little vacation. Yeah. Let us rise early and go to the vineyards. Let us see whether the vine has budded and its blossoms have opened and whether the pomegranates have bloomed. There I will give you my love. So she's planning a romantic interview interlude out there when she's when they're on vacation. And then verse 13, the mandrakes have given forth fragrance, and over our doors are all choice fruits, both new and old, which I have saved up for you, my beloved. Now, does everybody know about mandrakes? Yeah, mandrakes are like Viagra. <laughs> They're uh, old, old Testament Viagra. And uh, we can see that back in Genesis, way back in Genesis chapter 30. Remember, there was kind of a competition there uh, with Jacob for Jacob's affections. There was a competition in Jacob's family for his affections. And that's because probably the Lord was teaching Jacob that deceiving people is bad. You know, Jacob deceived his father. He got the birthright. He would have gotten the birthright anyway because the Lord prophesied it. He didn't have to do that. And he kind of did it reluctantly. His mother thought up the idea. And he did it reluctantly, but, um, and so Laban deceived him. He wanted Rachel. He worked seven years for Rachel. On his wedding night, the next morning, he, you know, had a lovely uh, wedding night and then woke up and there was somebody else there. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> and it was Leah. And so, yeah, so anyway, so then he, he worked for Rachel and then, of course, he got, a maidservant for each one, and they they used the maidservants to, and then later they had a childbearing competition, you know, and uh, this is part of that. So, well, Leah did bear Judah, yeah, and Levi, yeah. So, um, but anyway. This is Genesis 30, verse 14. Now in the days of wheat harvest, Reuben went. Remember, Reuben was Leah's firstborn and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Why was she doing that? She was barren. Rachel was dying to have children. She didn't have any children. Leah was having all these children, you know. and um, so she wanted these mandrakes because she thought it would help her get pregnant. But she said to her, Is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, Therefore he may lie with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. So Jacob and Rachel slept together because that's the wife he wanted. And... And she was saying, okay, I'll trade him to you for a night if I can get these mandrakes. And that happened. It says, when Jacob came in from the field in the evening, then Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. And, that, and thus came Issachar. <laughs> That's how we got Issachar, because they found mandrakes. So, yeah, mandrakes are supposed to be an aphrodisiac or something like that, or would help you conceive. I don't know if that was true. Uh, but we still see it in the time of we still see it in the time of Solomon. So in uh, chapter eight, verse one, oh that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breasts. Now why does she want to do that? Because she wants to kiss him. She wants to kiss him outdoors. That's what he says. If I found you outdoors, I would kiss you, and no one would despise me. So I think in the culture of that day, a public display of affection, you know, now I don't think anything of kissing my wife outside, you know. 
she might not like it, <laughs> but I don't think the culture cares. But uh, they didn't do that. But you could kiss your brother. You could kiss your brother, and she wanted to be able to do that. So verse 2 and verse 3, I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother who used to instruct me. I would give you spiced wine to drink from the juice of my pomegranates. That sounds a little bit suggestive. Let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. And so she wants to embrace. And now she can, you know, back in chapter 2, verse 6, the same phrase was given. And then she really, she couldn't at that time. And then verse 4, now she's giving uh, advice to the daughters of Jerusalem. I want you to swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken love until she pleases. Um, this sort of thing is meant only in marriage. Okay, section D, anything more about that? Somebody want to read that last section? It's verses 5 to the end. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Beneath the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she was in labor and gave you birth. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. We have a little sister, and she has no breasts. What, what shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will barricade her with planks of cedar. I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who finds peace. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He entrusted the vineyard to caretakers. Each one was to bring a thousand shekels of silver for its fruit. My very own vineyard is at my disposal. The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon, and two hundred are for those who take care of its fruit. O you who sit in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. Hurry, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Okay, so now she's there. The couple is coming back from their vacation. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? Leaning on her beloved. So she's leaning on him. So you have a mental picture of that. Verse 6 is the high point of the song. It's about marital love. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. <laughs> so um, she wants to be a seal on his heart and his arm. She wanted to be a possession that affected his thoughts and his actions, his heart and his arm. She wanted to be on his mind all the time, and she wanted him to be to care for her all the time. There is no human bond stronger, and it is the height of exclusive. Anybody ever see that uh, movie, uh, An Indecent Proposal? Robert Redford was in it. Um, I didn't watch it all the way through because it made me feel creepy. But um, a Demi Moore was a wife. They were a young husband and wife. I forget the husband's name. Robert Redford was a millionaire or billionaire, and he liked Demi Moore. She was married. The indecent proposal was that he would give the, her husband a lot of money to spend the night with her. And that was that was the movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's creeped out. Why is it? Why does it creep you out? Because of this. It says, if a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. That's why it creeps you out. 
So, um, because marriage is very exclusive. Um, back in verse uh, 9, it says, Love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. So when you're married to somebody, you, you know, if anyone else approaches that person, you your hackles come up. And it, it makes you start to be crazy, you know. And it will make people kill, even. You know, people kill for stuff like this. Those are crimes of passion. Uh, and why is it? It says it's flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. I keep losing my place, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is an attachment empowered by God. So then it goes on to, in verse 8, uh, they're talking about we have a little sister. She is not yet of marriage, marrying age. You know, she hasn't developed. She hasn't gone through puberty. Um, what should we do with her? <laughs> they're saying, you know, they're saying if she's a wall, what does that mean? Right, she has the willpower to say no. You know, the Shulamite speaks and says, I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers, which, you know, I guess I mean, you can't climb them right now. So she says, if she is a wall, she has a little more freedom. We will build on her battlement of silver. You know, you can decorate her. If she is a door... Has anyone ever seen the movie uh, Oklahoma? There's a character in there, a girl, who is a door. She can't say no. She sings the song about, I can't say no, you know. And so she will take any suitor, you know, and start kissing him, and she won't ever say no. So that's a door. And it says, we will barricade her with planks of cedar. <laughs> So, if she's a door, this is not going to be allowed, okay? And uh, why? Premarital sex is against the Lord's will. Um, it is exclusively for the marriage relationship. So, uh, verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He entrusted the vineyard to caretakers. Each one was to bring a thousand shekels of silver for its fruit. So this is, you know, Solomon was the king. He had a vineyard. These uh, He entrusted the vineyard to caretakers. So these are like sharecroppers. Uh, the, uh, the fruit would yield a thousand shekels of silver from the vineyard, and then in verse 12 it says the 200 are for those who take care of it. So caretakers would be paid 200 shekels of silver to tend the fields. And then she's comparing herself to the, the vineyard. She just says, my very own vineyard is at my disposal, and that's her, right? The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon. So she's going to give this to him for free. And 200 are for those who take care of its fruit. So this is a little blurb from, I used uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, which was 1985. Uh, it was, they're all written by Dallas Seminary professors. The, this guy was Jack Deere, who was the commentator. He concluded it as, The Song of Songs is a beautiful picture of God's endorsement of physical love between husband and wife. Marriage is to be monogamous, permanent, a monogamous, permanent, self-giving unit in which the spouses are intensely devoted and committed to each other and take delight in each other. So let's pray that all of our marriages are like this. So, Lord, we thank you for the Song of Solomon. Sometimes it makes us a little uncomfortable that we thank you that you've given it to us. And we know Hebrews uh, 13 says that the marriage bed is pure. And uh, we th thank you for that. And we thank you for this gift that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>